May 9, 1996. They say they're being replaced. A registered nurse gets $15, $20 an hour, and here you have a tech that you only pay $5 an hour. They say your health is at risk. We have individuals who have been in housekeeping involved in medical procedures, including stapling of a head wound. But hospitals say nurses refuse to recognize economic realities. Change is hard. Simple as that? I think so. Have you seen patient care being compromised? Nurses battling the health care revolution tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. What they are called, among other things, is clinical care partners, patient care assistants, patient care technicians, patient support associates. What they ought not be called is nurses, and for good reason. An RN, a registered nurse, has graduated from a state-approved school of nursing and has passed a licensing exam. Even an associate degree program takes two years. A licensed practical nurse is a high school graduate who's taken a 12 to 14 month course in basic nursing care. No such qualifications are required of the patient care assistants, associates, or technicians. Most of them are not even high school graduates. Few of them have had more than 15 days on the job training. But they may be asked to draw blood, insert urine catheters, or monitor vital signs in a patient. And that, say the nurses, thousands of whom are expected to demonstrate here in Washington tomorrow, that can be harmful to a patient's health. The nurses cite anecdotal evidence that is pretty scary. An unlicensed aide inserting a feeding tube to the opening for an air tube, choking an 81-year-old Pennsylvania man. But such stories are hard to confirm. It is clearly cheaper for hospitals and HMOs to hire aides in place of nurses, but it's not all that easy to prove that the public has been endangered. Nightline correspondent Dave Marish has the story. We are nurses. We are important. We are proud of who we are. So this Monday, Massachusetts nurses converged on the state capitol in Boston. I just read your letter that you sent the patient watch program. Last week, California nurses continued their investigation of patient complaints of poor care in hospitals coast to coast. The common thread I see is uh, it's less compassionate care that I'm seeing. And for months, New York nurses have been warning television viewers a growing crisis in health care could touch them. The people you think are nurses may not be nurses at all. Many New York hospitals are replacing real nurses with unlicensed, minimally trained assistants. While in Indiana, State Attorney General Pamela Carter says... We have individuals who've been in housekeeping and in performing janitorial uh, uh, services at some point asked when they were short staffed to perform significant, uh, including stapling of head wounds and things of that nature. Now, don't you want to go to Indiana and crack your head on the sidewalk and go into the ER? Hey, Joe, put down that mop. We've got a guy with a head wound here. Laura Gasparis von Frolio is a registered nurse and lecturer who reaches thousands of nurses through her out-of-the-basement magazine, Revolution. She led last year's march of 25,000 nurses on Washington, and she expects to lead twice that number to Capitol Hill tomorrow. We care for patients, and we just are asking for more time to do caring for our patients at the bedside. Von Frolio also interacts with thousands of nurses a year through her seminars, which always include one pointed question. Have any nurses here in this seminar seen that patient care, the quality of patient care, is being jeopardized, is becoming unsafe because of the restructuring, the downsizing, the re-engineering that's currently ha happening in hospitals throughout the United States? The response, Von Prolio says, is as predictable as the question. Nurses are very concerned that patient satisfaction is decreasing, patient complications are increasing, and patient deaths are increasing. And a nurse, being so concerned about those issues, has nowhere to go. If a nurse speaks out, that nurse will get fired. 
Von Frolio's final point was underscored when I spoke with a dozen or so attendees at her seminar in Spokane, Washington a couple of weeks ago. Every one of them conditioned their interviews on hiding their faces and changing their voices. I have fear for my job, but I'm most fearful for the patient. Why? Um, there is a med tech um, program starting in our area this fall, and um, I'm fearful that they will be replacing the RNs. In a survey released today, Von Frolio's Revolution magazine queried almost 1,800 registered nurses and found 74% of them had seen RN jobs cut from their hospital. 72% said the result was a decreased quality of health care. The Revolution survey results are similar to those gathered last year by the more mainstream American Nurses Association. The aides are not trained to do what we do. They do not have the physiology. They do not have the anatomy training. They don't have the medical training as far as medications, their interactions. Nurses say they don't fear that their jobs per se will disappear, but that the restructuring of their work under what has come to be called re-engineering will compromise their ability to protect patients' health. I've had to take care of patients in the neurointensive care unit, which I have not had training in neuro ICU for 11, 12 years. You must be terrified. I, it was very, for me, I, I just felt like I was doing the patient an injustice. Change is hard. Simple as that? I think so. I mean, Diane Friedman, a nurse and the chief operating officer of Covenant Medical Center in Urbana, Illinois, a hospital in the midst of re-engineering, says the aim is to produce better service for patients. If the model is well thought out, and I certainly believe our model is well thought, it was designed by nurses, it really looks at allowing the nurse to do those things that the nurse was educated to do, up to and including direct patient care. But a half a dozen Covenant nurses say patients are being hurt by the staffing changes of re-engineering and by another of its goals, faster care. Patients being sent home earlier than uh, maybe they, they should have been to come back through the emergency room and be readmitted to the hospital as a, with a complication um, of, of their early dismissal. When I asked Diane Friedman if Covenant's readmission rate had gone up since re-engineering, she told me the data wasn't in yet. And when I pressed her for death rates, in-house infection rates, and other measures of health care quality, she said... That data historically has not been readily available to consumers any place. Too true. Even a congressionally mandated commission tasked with answering the question, have cuts in bedside nursing jobs harmed patients, found they couldn't obtain inside information. Caroline Davis was the chairperson. Now, is it that there is no data or that the data is simply collected by hospitals which choose not to share it? It might well be the latter. We're not totally sure of that. What we did find was that a number of hospitals that have re-engineered have collected the data, but it's only to validate what they've done themselves, and so they're sitting on that data. The absence of good data has mired the public debate about hospital care in charges and countercharges, hospital managers saying dissident nurses are simply resistant to necessary professional change, while the nurses are replying the hospital industry is so interested in bettering its bottom line, it's willing to endanger the lives of its customers. I'm Dave Marish for Nightline in Washington. When we come back, a registered nurse, a hospital president, and a doctor on whether our hospitals are becoming more dangerous. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Joining us now in our Washington studios, Gwendolyn Johnson is a registered nurse and a member of the American Nursing Association's Board of Directors. Sister Carol Keen is president and CEO of Providence Hospital here in Washington. She is also a member of the American Hospital Association which asked that she represented on this program. Dr. Thomas Del Banco is Chief of General Medicine at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. He also teaches medicine at Harvard University. He joins us from our Boston Bureau. Sister Carol, um, the pun is intended. This ought not to be brain surgery. 
let me ask you to try to make this problem as simple for our viewers tonight as possible. How do you reassure them that what seems to be self-evident, and that is if you have lesser trained people dealing with patients, that they're going to be able to do as good a job as the nurses who had significantly more medical training? Well, I, I would say that one of the things that the piece didn't bring out is the study by the Institute of Medicine couldn't document anything but an anecdotal, some anecdotal stories, but they could document in terms of hard data that today in the United States there are 2.5 percent more RNs employed in hospitals than there were before. So that's point number one, and so I think people need to take that to heart. Secondly, people need to be partners in their care. When you choose a hospital, when you choose a physician, be a partner in your care. Ask questions. Ask questions of your physician before you're uh, admitted to a hospital. Ask questions of nursing staff. Ask for nursing management or hospital management. Let me, let me try and get to our other guests. Uh, Gordon Johnson, uh, if indeed the numbers of registered nurses is up 2.5%, uh, then how is it possible that we have fewer RNs working in our behalf if we're, if, we're, if we're admitted as patients? What we're finding, Ted, is that patients who are admitted to the hospital, they are admitted because they need 24-hour nursing care. They are sicker now than they were in the past when they were admitted. They're staying for shorter lengths of time. Unfortunately, many hospitals, many healthcare institutions are decreasing the number of registered nurses that are at the bedside. And instead, they are substituting them with the unlicensed aides that you referred to earlier that have minimal or no training. Why would they do that? If you have more nurses available, why aren't the nurses doing what you would think they would be doing, and that is taking care of the patients and having all these other assistants doing uh, some, of the, some of the less critical work? That's a very good point. Many hospitals are looking at cost-cutting measures, and unfortunately, a lot of hospital administrators are making unwise decisions. They are, in essence, being penny-wise and pound-foolish. What we're finding is that while there is limited data, there is data available, and most interesting recently is that there are data showing that patients and potential patients are worried about what's going on in America's hospitals. Let me, let me stop you and just move quickly to Dr. Del Banco because I'm, I'm still trying to get to the fundamental question, which with all due respect to, to both of our previous guests, Dr. Del Banco, I don't think uh, has been answered yet. Are patients in any greater danger today than they were a few years ago when there were fewer of these untrained people? The um, precise answer, Ted, is that we really don't know in terms of numbers that um, we would publish in fancy journals and give speeches about. We're only beginning now, and it's kind of a sad statement about our world, to learn how to measure the quality of what we do. We're really in what I think are the Model T stages of that. And um, we're beginning to do it better, and we're learning that we have to think about those whom we serve in ways differently from the way we did before. We've been very arrogant in our world. I think we're probably the last of the service industries that has really turned to the customer and said, tell us what you experience, teach us what you're seeing, help us through your eyes see what's going on, and then work with us to improve care. Let me pose a, a question to you, Dr. Del Banco, and, and we'll take a short break, and then when we come back, I hope you'll answer it. It seems to me that the locomotive, the engine of change here, is first and foremost economics. I'd like to get your reaction to that when we come back, which we'll do in just a moment. And we're back once again with registered nurse Gwendolyn Johnson, Providence Hospital President, Sister Carol Keane, and Dr. Thomas Del Banco. Um, Dr. Del Banco, the question was, is, is it money? Is, uh, is simple economics the engine of change here? I think money has been the stimulus. We've been kind of spoiled rotten in our field, frankly. In the world of health care, we didn't pay enough attention to costs, and I think the nation didn't. And now they're ratcheting down, as in so many other parts of the world, and it forces us to really examine in a much more analytic, careful way who should do what, for whom, to whom, with whom. And we're learning to measure what we do. For example, we've now surveyed probably 80,000 people in this country in a rigorous way to learn about their experiences with health care. We asked them, we asked their families, and now we're getting data that will be releasable. I realize, Sister Carol, that common sense doesn't always bring us to the truth, but it just seems to make common sense that if you have 
men and women who have received at least two years, possibly four years training in college as nurses, that they are going to be better equipped to deliver health care than people who have fewer than 15 days worth of on-the-job on training. Absolutely. There's not a question in the world. This country is blessed with a spectacular group of nurses. At the same time, I must say that we are changing the way we deliver care, some of it because of technology and some is absolutely, as you said earlier, Mr. Koppel, it's a market-driven, there are some market-driven issues going on. But basically, we still have the ethical responsibility to deliver safe care. The American public has a right to demand it, but they are also adding now a demand for efficient care. And as never before, we need the nursing input to define the, the ways we can measure what is quality, what is not, when you're cutting fat and when you're cutting muscle out of our health care delivery system. Nurse Johnson, I, I assume you are arguing that they are cutting some muscle here, certainly a lot of fat, but also some muscle. And, and be specific. What, what is it that you and your colleagues are most concerned about? We are concerned that they are cutting out the knowledge, the skill, and the expertise of the registered nurse at the bedside. Individuals will have to ask their, themselves the same question that I'll ask you, Ted. When you wake up from surgery and you're coming out of anesthesia, would you rather have a registered nurse who has that same two to four years of experience, who has the knowledge base, who has the expertise, or would you want that unlicensed person with, as you said so very clearly, 15 days perhaps of experience? America's public is saying no. And I think it's important that we translate health care from the dollars to the faces of the patients who are receiving that care. This is a time now when we can get nurses to the bedside to focus on what they're good at and get other people, for example, to do things that maybe nurses don't need to do. But, Same among, thing with Dr. but among those things, and I realize all of this is anecdotal, we're talking about stapling head wounds, we're talking about inserting uh, urinary catheters, mm -hmm. we're talking about taking blood pressure, we're talking about doing EKGs. Yeah. I, I would assume that those are all things that require a certain level of medical experience. But You're that's absolutely tremendous. right, Ted. You're absolutely right. And what's happening now is other individuals, other than registered nurses, are being given the responsibility for doing that. And that is what is the greatest concern, that that certainly endangers the safety and the Sister, quality of care. Sister Carol. Well, Mr. Coppola, I, I would say certainly we don't ever want people who are not competent and trained to do the level of care that 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 um, is that they're not qualified to do but clearly w at every step practically that's been made in developing standards of care over the past 20 or 25 years through the Joint Commission standards for quality of care for basic documentation of that quality for measurement of that quality almost every bit of that has had significant nursing impetus and input and right now we need the nursing input, not just to talk about what's good for having nurses at the bedside, but pharmacists, respiratory therapists, physical therapists. We need a comprehensive view of how we're going to develop quality care. Nobody at all wants to see an unqualified person caring for patients. And, and yet it seems to me self-evident that that's what you've got. Well, a, an anecdote doesn't make a trend. No, but a hundred anecdotes or a thousand anecdotes does begin to make but a trend. But do we have a hundred or a thousand documented anecdotes? Yes, we do. There are thousands Ted. of those stories out there, and those are stories that America's public wants to be told. They are very concerned that these things are going on and that we are not going forward with care decisions based on data. Ted. I would just like to add, Ted, if it's all right, when we talk about data, we hear a lot of discussion about the Joint Commission and what they know. What America's nurses are concerned about is what the patient has the right to know. They need to know what they should be asking when they call a hospital, when they ask a doctor about this hospital. What is the number of RNs? What number of unlicensed personnel will be providing care? Will I see a nurse every hour? Or will I see that nurse more often if I need them? Will I have access to that data? Will I know what kind of care that hospital is providing? Let me just have Dr. Del Banco because we're just about out of time. Uh, Ted, it put, seems put to me that note on this. it seems to me if I were a person listening to this, I might be frightened and worried about all the heat and the lack of light. If you're a person in America worried about your health care, ask your friends about the experience they have at the hospital you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Get the data from the hospitals. Make them 
measure properly, make them get the na names out to you, make them give you a suggestion Unfo about people you could talk to. Unfortunately, Dr. Del Banco, as you well know, usually when people are going to a hospital, it's not something they plan three or four weeks right. in advance. Very often it's something that, that, that has to happen immediately in a, in a sense of crisis. That's not the time that you can start making. Let me just put the question. It's going to be the last question I have time to pose. Let me put the question to you very bluntly. Is the level of nursing care that you are familiar with in hospitals across the country today as good today as it was three, five years ago? Well, my experience, quite frankly, is that it may be better. The nurses have greater skills. They're focusing harder, and they're having to do the most important things first, and that's always good for a patient. And on that reassuring note, then, let me thank all of you, uh, Gwendolyn Johnson, Sister Carol Keehan, Dr. Thomas Del Banco. Good of you to be with us. I'll be back in a moment. And finally, this program note, tomorrow, a Nightline Friday night special. In 1980, Washington was rocked by the extraordinary story of an eight-year-old heroin addict. The story won a Pulitzer Prize for the Washington Post until its author admitted it was all a lie. Janet Cook, the author, speaks publicly for the first time in 14 years tomorrow night on Nightline. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, 